Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're with Dr. Paul Karpecki, and we're going to be talking about future technologies and industry's role in education on The OI Show. So thank you for joining us, everybody, for the this episode of the Optometric Insight Show. Make sure to like, subscribe, and uh, feel free to leave comments below. Today, we're joined by Dr. Paul Karpecki, who needs very little introduction in the optometric space. Dr. Park Karpaki, thank you for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing great, Dr. Kading, and certainly call me Paul, but thank you for the opportunity to get to uh, be part of this great podcast. It's, uh, it's yeah. an honor. Absolutely. So, Paul, you have had so many areas of influence here in the optometric community. One of the great things that I love when I hear you lecture is you bring so much insights to, uh, to your education uh, and in your writing. Uh, and I think that's because you're still involved in the clinic. You're one of the busiest optometrists I know, uh, but you still are involved in the clinic. Can you walk through for us what you're currently involved in, both clinically as well as professionally? What's taking up your time other than, uh, other than your amazing children at home? Thank you, Dave. That's a great first question because it lets me kind of go through things. You know, you said something real key. You know, some people I think could still lecture without seeing patients. Somehow they do. Uh, some could write. I, I'm not one of those people. I'm always thinking. Uh, when I'm in the clinic, I'm always coming up with trying to find new ideas. And could we do this differently? What if we streamline this? And what if I educated on this new thing? You know, and then I'm also calling colleagues who, who have led the path, you know, in MGD and dry eye like Don Corb and getting their insights and trying to work it out in the clinic. So, Without doing that, there's just no way. I still see, you know, well over 100 to 150 patients a week, probably more than 150 actually, uh, between my main clinic. Also, help see a clinic in Indiana that I still see about 40 to 50 patients a day in there. That's down to a couple times a month, but still, uh, between all of those, it's real critical. But that's just the way my brain works. I kind of need that in order to to do the other things and. So I guess if I didn't practice, I probably couldn't lecture either or to be writing because that's really what it all stems from is getting in there. And it's a little bit of a mindset of how my brain works. I think I'd be stagnant without it. And I think you're similar too. the more we see, yeah. the more we think about things. And then when I'm able to capture a video or a really neat case, that becomes fodder for a really good lecture, a really good paper where I can help, you know, elevate our profession. That's always been my goal. What can I do to, we've got such a wonderful profession, optometry, kind people hardworking people, just quality individuals where have a sense of humbleness amongst our profession in general. So, you know, I'm always trying to think what things could help our profession advance. And one of the good things is being in clinic and discovering those, those insights. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that uh, people may not know about you because you're so well known in the dry eye space in the anterior segment disease space is you've got a pretty big glaucoma practice too, if I remember correctly. Am I, am I right in that? You are. I mean, I'm always coming up on the prescribers list, so I must have quite a few, but I, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that, I mean, I could probably get by with a lecture, but that's where, you know, I think our profession does so well is that we've got docs who are extremely good in certain areas. Yeah. And, you know, I would consider myself a good clinician in glaucoma, but but not an expert. I'm still listening to the Murray's and, and Ben and Eric and everybody who's lecturing on this and understanding it better. And, and I'm taking those little pearls and working back, but yeah, I do. And I, and I did a year of preceptorship during uh, when things kind of got a little shut down a little before that we had had um, children through three in a row within two years. And I wanted to have a year where I wasn't traveling so much. So I did a full year of preceptorship in advanced retina, one of the top 20 retina practices in the country. And so that's another little area that I feel actually in retina, I feel really good at. That's I saw yeah. so much in the course of that year that, um, and it wasn't every single day. I still had my dry eye cornea clinic, but it filled in the days that I wasn't there, two days for at the beginning of the week. And so, um, you know, that's an area where I still have pride in. But the reason for that is I felt like I just, if I'm, if I'm like, for example, one of my roles is the chief medical uh, editor for review of optometry. It's the most read journal in our profession. I'm always getting these questions on, is this a good topic in retina or in glaucoma? And I always felt inept, you know, to kind of answer that. So having that now has really helped me to say, hey, this definitely fits and I could edit this and I could look at that and it makes me a little more rounded. So there was a purpose or a reason for that madness of taking on that extra thing. But I'd say in glaucoma, you know, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but I love the disease area. I love managing those patients. 
Uh, I love the challenge of it, uh, but you're probably not going to see me lecturing too much in glaucoma. Right. The odd dinner program for something I'm using, that might be the extent of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that, that you just laid the foundation there for something is that when, when, when we're thinking about things that we're going to be educating ourselves, we think about how we're going to be helping our patients, but we're also, how can we also help our profession? And, you know, being the chief medical officer, you took on this retina role to be better in the clinic, but also to be able to help better our profession. And that's something that we've always appreciated about you, Paul, is, is that advocacy for the profession. Other than review of optometry, you also work with a lot of companies. And we'll get into that a little bit in a moment here. But what does that look like? What does it look like as far as a review of optometry, clinic, and how else are you spending your time? Well, yeah, you know, I, I, that's one of the problems. I do get into things a little too much, no matter what I get into it. I don't have this ability to suddenly shut it off when it comes to, to drive around exciting things. I mean, I just enjoy that. Um, so I, I love the aspect of, of the dry eye clinic and trying to, find to, trying to find a way to crack that code. It only took me 23 years. But I think I'm finally at a stage where, you know, and, and you and I have talked about some of these insights. I've actually relied on you for some of them, such as, how to treat, you know, like the patients with really advanced MGD. The goal is no longer symptomatic improvement. It's just preventing progression. So I'll be fair. I take a lot of ideas from a lot of people. I don't know if you remember having that conversation with me, but I took that yeah. idea back and thought, hey, this makes total sense. And, and so we've got to a point now where I think we're somewhere around 97% successful. And these patients that I see are, are really advanced. The only, only way you could get in my clinic is being referred by a colleague optometric colleague, ophthalmology, rheumatology, I get oncology referrals, uh, derm. So it, it's a lot of referrals, but these are the patients that just are really advanced. So to get that level is pretty neat. I have over 600 positive diagnosed Sjogren's syndrome patients in my dry clinic. So it's a very advanced level clinic. And the only reason I, I know that number is we had to do a research study on, and they want to know how many Sjogren's patients we have. So we pulled up our ICD-10 codes and lo and behold, we had 580. And that was you know, a year and a half ago. So I got to figure we had at least 20 since then to be over 600. Um, so that is still something that drives me. But then the part that I'm kind of getting to is also, could I find a way to then transfer those 23 years of knowledge? And you really can't do it in a two hour lecture or on, you know, you're doing these pearls every week, but someone would have to read them every single week. And, and it doesn't give you every single thing that you can have. I, I think I've got to find ways to do better mentorship to say, okay, how do we take this in really small bites? And then take all of that and create experts um, in the area, those that can, can understand every aspect. So let's say blepharitis is not just blepharitis, it's a whole section on what Demodex is and treatment, whole section on staff, whole section on seborrheic. So there's three weeks right there of these podcasts, whatever it might be, you know, then, then the next section might just be, uh, you know, going into MGD, which could be seven or 10 different subsections. And Doctors can really get such a confidence in each one. Something like that has got to be in the next realm for me. But speaking of which research, I think that's where the industry to your question comes in. I still um, probably about 11 different research projects, 11 different companies right now where we try things for these patients and try to advance them. And that's where a lot of it starts. And then you build the relationships and then you kind of advance from there. Uh, but I think that that intermingling of industry and the profession and the educators and all that can be done in a good way. And I, for example, I mean, who's going to know more about an instrument that's been developed than the developer? You know, if it's a, whatever it might be, a bride or an express or a just tool for thermal pulsation, the person who invented it is going to know more about teaching it than anybody. And yet, of course, that person's in industry because that's what they're doing now. So, so to take that away uh, would would make no sense. It would leave us at a huge disadvantage. Or the person who was involved in the research that figured out how to use it and where it fit in. That's who I want to hear from. Of course, they're tied in the industry or they're working with a company. So as, a, as an employee, so you you have to find ways to to allow for proper use of that and to disclose properly and to, to be completely transparent. But to negate industry, you know, I think we'd all be set back in our knowledge. I mean, Don Corb, for example, I use his name a lot because he taught me so many things, but, you know, he, he created the Lippy Flow in that system. To not have him teaching us at the beginning, it would have taken us two or three years to figure that out. And then who's going to do that and utilize it and be successful? Yep. So that's just one example. Um, there are many where, where that ability to connect the two uh, is extremely important to advancing the profession. 
Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I remember back to some of my early days in uh, the KOL world where we, uh, you know, I was talking about allergy and I remember learning about allergy in optometry school, but sitting around a table with colleagues, sitting around a discussion with, with some companies and talking about allergy raised my awareness about it. And then I could go out and speak. And, you know, you mentioned this, who better than to teach us uh, you know, it, funny you say that. I have a, a call in a half hour as soon as we're done here with the inventor of a contact lens. He is in industry, uh, but how else am I going to learn anything else about that contact lens than from the industry person alone? And I think there's a stigma um, that within eye care and healthcare that uh, that industry plays this part, and it's, it's an evil. And, you know, I think you and I over the years have, have kind of developed and have this understanding. Share with me a little bit about how you've seen the transition within industry over the last 10 years for the better and maybe for the worse. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when I think of industry, the first person that comes to mind in our profession was actually Kirk Smick. Kirk oh, is, yeah. you know, retired, but he was probably the first person to have realize the importance of industry and the benefits to optometry if it's done right. And, uh, you know, he probably opened a lot of the doors for those who kind of followed along later. And, and really, there, it can be both. I like how you describe that. You know, I, I give colleagues who say, you know, I, I want to be able to do more for the profession. I want to elevate them. I want to be able to I have these ideas I want to bring to companies to help them either create a product or to take my product there. And I say, make sure you get your IP in place, make sure you have all these things, you know, ahead of time. And, and I think it's a great idea. But they also say, but I don't want to also be seen as someone who is bought for and paid for and, and just kind of a commercial producer, you know, who's, who's just making commercials for whatever product it is. And so there are both the extremes. And I think, you know, it, ultimately, if you lose your credibility, uh, someone who just promotes a product no one's going to listen to you anyways. You you become of no value. I mean, you you really, you know, we know this person is just a promoter and it's kind of like you tune them out and you look for those who can truly educate me and advance me and provide me the things I need. And, and so there is a really good way to do it. And, and ultimately if you do it the right way, everyone benefits, especially the patient ultimately. And as long as we're thinking of it that way, it tends to work extremely well. So it has gone through some reiterations where there were people who were what I would call promoters and, you know, and it's it's really not, that doesn't serve the profession. Um, you know, ultimately, it, it would never work anyways, because if you promoted something from the podium, let's say, during CE, and it really didn't work, and doctors went back and tried it, and it didn't work, they would remember that speaker, I would hope. So, you know, you have to always be, you know, speaking from a level of experience, you have to be able to maintain your credibility, you have to do, ultimately, things with integrity. I mean, it's still what it comes down to in so many of these cases. And you know in your heart if this is the right thing to do or if it's not. I mean, it becomes very obvious. And when you stay away from situations that can risk your credibility. And, and you know, I would say every year I, I have 10 companies that approach me and I'd be lucky. I don't know that I even added one in the last two years. Now, COVID got in the way a little bit of that, but I can't think of one that I became an advisor for. And it I, you know, I have to really believe in the product. I have to, to test it. I have to have experience. I have to talk to the experts who invented it. Many times it's other colleagues or, you know, and I, I have to try it out. And, and I even maybe do my own little sub study in my office to see if it's better than what I was doing or using. And then I have to believe in the people. They have to be quality individuals that uh, have high integrity because I've worked with great products, but not so good people. It never never works well. Um, yeah, third, I, I, to, I want to jump, yeah. on, jump on something you just said, Paul. Yeah. You mentioned how you do these little tests on your own patients, right? And, and, and you're not experimenting because this is an approved medication or an approved treatment, but you want to know, is it working as good or better than something else that's out there? Um, and these are already approved products. So this isn't really a research study, but it's just for you. Yeah. How do you set something like that up for, for your own knowledge? Yeah, I mean, you're not publishing this per se, but just for yourself, how would you recommend our optometric colleagues go through that? Some of them haven't, you know, ever really put it to the test, so to speak, and, and really found that data out. How, how do you go about that? Well, I think it starts by listening to the experts to begin with, to even consider it. For example, I've had some nutritional products for dry eye mouths that I carried for eight or nine years. And then, uh, you know, one of my good friends was involved in some of the a research study on it that had 
compelling results. I mean, it was almost done like an FDA trial. It was pre-specified endpoints. They hit their signs or symptoms. I remember reading this paper and I called him, you know, I said, John, is this really this legitimate? This paper seemed to sure is. So that made me think that maybe there is another nutritional product I should try. It was about a third of the price. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So I called the company up and said, hey, I'd love to test this amongst my patients. I've got hundreds of people on this existing nutritional supplement. I'm going to try yours and I'm just going to see what they say. And the company was kind. They sent me, you know, 20 bottles. That was enough for me to do a study or 30. And they don't always do that, but I think they knew that, you know, I really want to check these things out. They're both approved products. They're both on the market. And I just said, hey, I'm going to let you try another product. Um, you know, I want you to tell me if it's the same, worse, better, no difference, can't tell. You know, over nine out of 10 of the patients said they noticed a difference, which surprised me for a nutritional product. And all of a sudden it was like, okay, well, I can't really offer the other product. What's interesting is I actually was an advisor to the previous product. Uh, and they, because it was the early startup, I had stock options that they gave me as an advisor. So in my best interest would have been for the first product to actually work and not test the second product, but ultimately you have to do what's best for your patients. And so the new product became, which I the time was not a consultant or anything or involved as an advisor. And then I utilized it. And then I did become a consultant to them later because I found other ways that maybe they hadn't thought of this, or maybe this could be better, but it's something as simple as that, Dave. It's just, you, you can't, you know, you have to really have the experience to be able to, to teach others and to advance. You can't assume, you know, that it is better just because someone wants to hire you as a speaker. You, you have to really have the clinical experience. So it starts with that. And that's why I think it works well together. It's not a case of people just sign up to be speakers, and, you know, for a, for a company and do these dinner programs and they get paid for them. And really, you know, truthfully for a day out, I, I'd be much better off staying in clinic, you know, financially. We would. <laughs> It's yeah. what it is, is it, it does by having the experience, you're able to then say, hey, I, I've seen this work in this case and this applies here. And then CE is a little different, you know, that you don't really need to talk about products. You, you really need to be talking about concepts and how these things work and, and where the where they work best and which technologies work on which patient really trying to contribute as much to the listener that they could take these pearls, go back and, and improve their clinic and improve the lives of their patients. And I think that's how the system kind of works really well. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, you can't, you have to maintain your credibility. That's one of the yeah. things you can't be up here saying this is best. And that is you have that are they're exactly the same products. You have to maintain it. You have to do things that elevate optometry. Otherwise, why would you be yeah. involved in? And then you have to also know that maybe you can help this company. Maybe I can advance their ability. And if you can't do that, I'd I wouldn't help, wouldn't get involved yep. in it either. So there's a lot of these criteria, I think, that you just have to naturally have in place. And when they are, it, it works well for everybody. So if you're seeing 20 patients or 30 patients with a, with a product or something like that, are you keeping a spreadsheet so that you can keep track of that data? I mean, you know that it's about nine or 10, or is that just something where, you know, I'm, I'm noticing these trends, you know, how would you recommend our colleagues start doing that if, uh, as clinicians, right? So it's clinician researchers. That's what we really are is we're always yeah. practicing and right. finding something. Do you find that you're kind of keeping track of that data as you're testing different products out? I, you know, I do have a, my my scribe who also kind of re oversees my whole clinic. Carla, she is fantastic. She does track those things. Yeah. I, the way I, prior to her, I had just gone by the trends. I could see all these people are coming back saying, Dr. Arpecki, I really like this product. It, I'm seeing a difference for patients who are like, I'm expressing beautiful oils and are only on, they only had one treatment. Well, I know the treatment was the cause. So that kind of stuff becomes your trend and you get a really good idea of, of how that fits in. So I don't think you have to make it complex. I think you just want to be able to tell. Now you do have to rely on other people and colleagues that you trust to even try something new. Why would you? But I think it's incumbent on those who are, you know, doing a lot of a certain thing, dry eye, glaucoma, whatever, that are sharing their insights in a very credible way uh, because it's back tested. If you say something that they should try and it doesn't work, they're not gonna to listen to you going forward. You really have to be able to say, hey, I've found that this combination works extremely well for this type of patient, or if it's a new drug for neurotrophic keratitis, you know, this is something you wanna look at. These are the ideal candidates and here's where you find them. And that kind of education, I think we all we all do well with and it elevates all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you kind of alluded to how when we leave the office and go and do some of these programs financially, it may be more beneficial for us to have stayed home. I think that's important for somebody to know, but also continuing education. 
I mean, we're putting hours in preparation into those things. And, uh, and, you know, it's just, it's because we love the profession and have so much fun doing it. And I think as we look at our optometric colleagues that you and I know so well, that's something that we certainly appreciate about their education. I did, I did want to ask you uh, about what the future holds. How do you see uh, some of these industry things that are some trends within our industry? And then can you speak about some things that are exciting that are in the future, you know, phase two, phase three, with some of these companies that you're working with, of what you're hoping that we see in the future and how it's going to, you know, change the landscape of eye care. I, I love this conversation, and you know, talking about the future. I do too. This stuff really intrigues and excites me a lot um, because there's just so much that we're going to see and it's going to change our landscape. The good thing too is optometry is really well, well positioned because of we've had good leadership in those areas, the AOA state associations, understanding where the future is. So it all applies to that. But also at the same time, there's not enough ophthalmologists. You know, there's they graduate about 431 ophthalmologists and that's been the same number for more than two mm -hmm. decades. So they, they really were we're not anticipating the growth we've seen in baby boomers and other needs. And, and now with, you know, looking at these calls, these podcasts, these zoom interviews, all these things are drying our eyes. So we're going to get more and more patients in need. There's presbyopia drops coming out. So that'll bring in all of these emetropic presbyopes that never came to our office before. So it's the numbers really allow our profession to, to get into this blue ocean. And, you know, I know, you know, the blue ocean strategy book, but it's a wide open space right now. There's, if you ask any surgeon, would you rather do medical eye care or surgery? They all look at you like you're crazy. It's surgery. And, and, but there's not enough of them to do both. So optometry has this wonderful area. And at the same time, we are getting some threats in optical and in contact lenses. That's always going to happen. So having that diversity into medical is, is important, but I think it's going to, the future is going to intersect. For example, keratoconus right now, we typically manage that with scleral lenses and other forms to kind of keep it controlled and RGPs and other CRT type things. Well, there's a company working on a drop that you would use, you know, that could help slow that down and then keep them in something a little simpler. So it's that combination. There's another company working on a scleral lens that has a transducer in it where you put the riboflavin in the lens, put it on the eye for 30 minutes, it cross-links the cornea. So you're using a scleral lens, but you're permanently keeping the keratoconus from progressing. Uh, it corrects refractive error, that's small amounts of myopia up to about three diopters. And so all of these little interesting things or three diopters of hyperopia would be a better fix. Sometimes having a little low myopia is kind of nice in the future. But nevertheless, it, it is this, you know, this intertwining of these things. Um, you know, when you get into ocular surface disease, you realize that the most common form of blepharitis is demodex because we, we don't have a good way to treat it other than maybe low level light therapy is do work to an extent. But if we had a drop, that would be exciting. And there's a drop about 18 months away that has over 90% eradication rates for Demodex. So something we've never um, treated before. Uh, you know, drops for contact lenses, scleral lenses in that category. There's drops that will reverse pterygia if they're able to, to go through that process. I've got, we've got keratolytics, which prevent keratin from forming on the top of the meibomian glands, which leads to a lot of breakdown. Lipogenesis drops that'll help provide proper lipids. You still do your in-office thermal pulsation, but then you have something to maintain it. Um, there's another one that's actually a lipid solubilizing drop. That would be a wonderful way to maintain it long term. I think our that dental model continues to expand. It works really well in my clinic where patients come in for treatments with a technician, whether it's blood flux foliation, thermal pulsation, IPL, low level light therapy, and then they're maintained on something as long as we're able to do that and we control the elements. I also think a lot of the future is simplification, even though we just went through all of what we just described as being complex and um, but simplifying things so we get more success, meaning, you know, I love the whole, the, the phrase that Mark Twain said, where or his quote, if I had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. And it's true in, in dry eye, for example, we created this complex algorithm of do this and that and this test and that no wonder doctors couldn't get a hold of it. It's too complex. I think the future is going to be simplification. This is all you need to look at. This works well. Use some technology here and and you can see more patients with dry eye than you could ever do a regular exam. So then all of a sudden it, it becomes financially beneficial, certainly patient beneficial to get into that realm as well. I also think other areas are going to advance like macular degeneration. There's going to be a new drug for dry AMD that's likely going to come out. We're going to play much more of a role of identifying those patients earlier with new technologies that help identify that can track. And there's some already out, of course, like dark adaptation things, but tracking them better being able to look at carotenoid measurements, being able to make a difference there, know when to send them to own those areas. In glaucoma, we're gonna have overlap between 
not just drops, but how do we spare the ocular surface that gets so beat up and, and kind of a trend is moving in that direction now. So we're doing more injectables and devices and procedures, and we have seven states that could do lasers. So we're continuing to do more to help the patient in the long run. So that's where the future is going to get to, but we got presbyopia drops that'll come in, but they won't take us away from our contact lenses. They won't take us away from progressives. No one's gonna, it's gonna be a very small percentage that'll use those every day, but they're gonna wanna use them with those other things. And there's as many emetropic presbyopes as there are myopes. So our entire, which is the majority of what optometry sees, there's actually more emetropic presbyopes. If we could find a way to bring them in, we would double our volume. Well, it might be this drop. They see an advertisement on this, they come in, they get their health, eye health exams from optometry. We, optometry sees 85% of all comprehensive eye exams. I mean, that's one of the most powerful places you could be of any profession where you see 85% of any one entity. I don't think there's another medical sub profession that, that does that uh, anywhere. So you have this great opportunity there to be able to figure out what's best to own and understand the areas. And I don't mean own in the sense of financial, just, hey, I can take care of AMD all the way until I refer it to the retina specialist. I could take care of glaucoma all the way until I get to that level. There's gonna be you know, things we could wear at nighttime that are like a CPAP that'll help in glaucoma that we can dial the pressure right to where we want it to be. There's gonna be, I can own ocular surface disease, which we really as optometrists should, but now it's easier to manage and I understand where each one fits in and what do I do and then streamline it, make it simple for what we do after. So I think the world's our oyster as optometrists just because of the number of patients that we don't see that we could uh, but the opportunities are really medical. That's that's where all the new trends and everything are going into. And so we have to have a very balanced, uh, you know, approach to patients. Yes, optical is key. Yes, contact lens is key. But don't miss that medical opportunity. And COVID was a great example. Those who were doing, you know, telemedicine, you can only do that if you had medical capability. So those who didn't really had to shut down. And, and that's a little bit of a peek into, hey, we better be diversified. We better understand these things. We better find the areas we're most passionate in. That's the future for optometry. You hold on to what you're strong in, but find other areas of passion that'll help lead you into the future. Yeah, you're right. You need a podcast of your own. You could just talk <laughs> about each one of those things that you just said for an episode and you'd have a whole year of podcasts out there, Paul. Yeah, yeah this is fantastic information. Paul, if people want to follow you or hear more about what's going on or some educational information, um, I know you have review. What, what are some things that people could link into and we'll leave them in the show notes? What, what, what would be a good place to hear from you more often? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, my LinkedIn account is certainly one you can just look me up in. It has everything kind of being put on there right now and posted and where the future opportunities are. You know, I am going to do, you know, that, that Zoom series on dry eye that gets to the little details of, hey, each, each week, at let's say, you know, 9 p.m. on, on a Thursday night, we'll do a, do a one-hour Zoom call on one subsection to just really understand it. And I'll put all those in there. My email is carpecky at carpecky.com if they can't find the links and the things that are present in that. Um, it'll have its own website, so I'll provide that to you at that point, Dave, uh, you know, to do that. Doug DeVries and I have worked on a couple of cool technologies that, you know, uh, Ophthalmic Resources is the company that's kind of a placeholder right now, but it will have a lot of the electronic algorithms that we have figured out through AI. That means it feeds itself back for us to figure out, was this the right direction to treat this patient versus this patient? And, and some new technologies. He's developed these little seals that you wear at nighttime for these patients who have incomplete closure that are incredible in terms of how they work. And you know those sort of things are, are things I'm really excited about to your point that I've been working on that I think will help a lot of patients. But uh, yeah, yeah. Those you, have a little, you have a little newsletter that has a tiny following as well, don't you? I've got, uh, I'm, I'm joking. It's, it's, it's got a very large following. Uh, tell everybody about that and where they can find it. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Dave. You know, the, probably the one that's really doing well through review also, we should probably kind of include that one in there is the clinical Pearl series. Right. It, yep. it does have an open rate that's somewhere around 70%, which is just shows the need, um, you know, that's, that's out there for, um, for understanding it in little bits and pieces where you can garner it and, and through that. So it's, it's called Clinical Pearl. It's actually sponsored by Cal Ophthalmics, who makes Isuvis. I got to credit them for having the foresight to see that that's important because not a lot of it is specifically on steroids, but just knowing how mm -hmm. important it is to understand dry eye. Um, but that that's a neat little newsletter that comes out every week. And again, that's uh, through our Medscape friends who put that together uh, through a review of optometry. Yeah. 
Thank you. Well, we'll leave a, a link in the show notes. Um, thank you, Paul, for being part of this episode, for being part of the OI show. We're always blessed whenever we get to hear you, love hearing you in education. You've been an incredible friend to our profession and to me personally. So thank you for joining us for this episode of the OI show. Thank you, Dave. It's been an honor. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. And uh, thank you for listening in for this episode of the Optometric Insight Show. Make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned for more episodes of the OI Show.